three years ago, we made a video talking about a remodeling of a volume builder home to a high performance building. Today, we are going to do a fifth quarter review to see how the occupant experienced the home after three years. Let's get in. This is the finished house after three years. This is our homeowner, Ralph. After three years, how does this house compare to your expectation? Yeah, it's, it, to be honest, it's exceeded our expectations because we just wanted something a bit more energy efficient, a bit more comfortable, a bit healthier. Yeah, there have been some bonuses we didn't expect uh, in terms of the amount of pests that are not here. It's incredibly quiet. It's incredibly comfortable and energy efficient. So yeah, it's exceeded, it's clean, it's not as dusty. So yeah, enormous, enormously exceeding our expectations, that's for sure. Yeah, loving it more and more each year. Wow, that sounds great. Let's come back to your first point, energy efficiency. How much does it reduce your energy bill compared to before your remodeling? Yeah, it's enormous because it was so leaky before and there was so much moisture and therefore it was cold. So we had a ducted heating system before and that just used to blast all the time as soon as the cool months arrived. Whereas now we have one split system, one split system there that was originally here so we kept it. And because of the heat recovery ventilation system, we find that we don't have to use it much, but when it's very cold and three, four days in a row, no sun and so on, we turn it on for three hours maybe, first thing in the morning, and that's enough to distribute the heat everywhere, and we're fine, we turn it off. So there's now no gas, this is the only heating system in the whole house, and literally the heat recovery ventilation system, I think, does enough. So our bills are, for some portions of the year, non-existent, and for some portions just minimal, under $100. That it's not just the actual temperature, the number, that's 20 or 21, there's a feeling of comfort that sometimes if it's 19, you just feel more comfortable when you're not cold. Actually, the biggest thing I noticed is in the mornings. So when you wake up in the morning, I, when it was cooler, I always used to notice my, my nose was freezing. Yeah. I'm like, oh, do you touch it and it's like touching ice? I never have a cold nose anymore waking up. That's been my, my sort of temperature gauge. I'd say, we don't have much in terms of the house getting colder than below 16 and we don't go much above 28 or so. So there's still quite a big variation, but we used to have six degrees up to whatever it was outside, yep. 38, yep. You know, whatever. Yep. So yeah, it, it's a hell of a lot more comfortable. Having said that, you say the range is between 16 to say um, 28, yeah. but the number of hours that you got those more extreme temperature is rare, right? Exactly, much less, yeah. much, much less. So you yeah. still get them because we're in Victoria, you know, it gets yeah. freezing and it gets stinking hot yeah. at different times. But yes, much, much less. I'd say for at least 10 to 11 months, we don't need to condition the air in any way, whether it's cooling it or heating it. One of the reasons that this house is feeling a lot more comfortable compared to conventional home with the same air temperature is all the services are well insulated with no or minimal um, thermal bridging. So you got the same temperature coming from all your walls and ceiling that doesn't suck heat out of your body. That improves your sense of comfort a lot. This is one of the benefits of high performance building. Yeah, we found the same thing, you know, you'd touch a surface or mention it's not freezing. Yep. You're ex exactly as you say it. Um, your body's not trying to work hard to, to compensate for whatever the temperatures are. Yeah, so from a healthy building point of view, which is a big one for me and our family, being a building biologist, th there's so many different aspects to it. So everything that we chose in terms of the paints, the, the floors, the, the fabrics, all of that type of thing, are either no VOC or very low VOC. We try to go for as, as many natural fabrics and fibers and materials as we possibly can. So being a building that is tight, we basically don't want VOCs in here because they're going to hang around a bit more than, than otherwise. Yeah. 
So we're very mindful in that place. But the main aspect, I think, is from the water intrusion and therefore mould and pests mm. and dust mites and all the rest of it. Because when we pulled out from down the roof, we had the insulation that was just collapsing. It was just revolting. It was wet. It had rat and mouse all of their defecating and everything all over the place. It was revolting, particularly with regards to mould. When you opened up some cavities, yep. seeing water intrusion, hidden mould and, and that type of thing, it's all gone. It's all completely dry and therefore, you know, very comfortable. EMF thing was another big one that we won't go into too much detail, but the whole house was recabled. So we don't have spaghetti cabling around all the walls. We have it running in, and then coming out in single runs and grouped together like a commercial building. We have master switches, which will kill the power to bedrooms when we go to sleep at night. Everything's physically cabled, no Wi-Fi and yeah. so on that we use. All the computers and too, it's yeah. all physically cabled with shielded cabling. So yeah, there's a lot involved in the healthy bull. And of course, the dust levels with the heat recovery ventilation systems. When we get those nasty northerlies blowing that bring all the re revolting yeah. particulates and, and pollens and so on that's all filtered out and we have a lot less dust in the house so the dust load it's cleaner even the bathrooms and I'm going on a lot but the bathroom the showers will have solid panels completely minimized no grout there's only three little strips of silicon so we don't have mold growing in all of that well in addition to that I got one question that we've been talking about a lot which is co2 in the home and Usually, we can only talk about the anecdote, but for this particular house, because Rob is a building biologist, he has measurement to track how the CO2 level is throughout this house. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So beforehand, when I took, level, uh, took measurements of carbon dioxide, I found that in the bedrooms, where it's either one child bedroom or, or my, my wife and I and so on, if I took a reading first thing in the morning, it would be always 2,000 parts per million or a little bit above, which you'd kind of expect. It's a fairly leaky building, but I was surprised to a degree because I'm like, well, it's leaky, so I would have thought some air would come in and it wouldn't be that high. But yeah, 2,000 parts per million, everything closed up in winter. And now since that, taking readings in a bedroom first thing in the morning, it's less than half that. We wouldn't get anything above 900 or so. As building biologists, we like it to be under 700. Uh, we'd spend, you know, not talking about sleeping, but during the day. When we take an open living area before the reno, we had readings of around 1,500 parts per million. Yeah. I'd say 13 to 1,600, you know, 1,400 around that parts per million. And that's what you're living in each day. Yep. But since the reno, because of the heat recovery ventilation or ventilation system bringing in fresh air all the time, we basically have what is outdoors. So we'll have three, four hundred parts per million um, all the time. I noticed there's one thing quite unusual compared to other passive house strategy kind of building is a guest cooktop. How yes. do you mitigate that? Yeah, that, that was a big discussion point. That's because I do all the, all the cooking in the house and I love my cooking. And from an EMF point of view, the induction cooktop is just not something I, I could put in. And I know that's the way it's going to have to be. We're not going to have a choice. That, yep. That's it. But luckily... Hold yeah, on to your gas Yeah, supply. we're holding on to our one gas cooktop. That's the only reason why we connect it to gas. Mm. There's nothing else that is gas and it was already connected. I did test the oxygen levels, testing it right there by the range hood and testing it when I'm cooking, when I'm not yep. cooking, just basically having it on all day, and found that the oxygen levels didn't drop. So the 21 odd percent or whatever, it was not dropping below that at all. So there was no depletion of oxygen levels, there was enough other oxygen coming in. Yep. And from the CO and CO2 levels, the range hood that we have is basically the motors up on the outside as opposed to the range yep. head for magnetic field reasons, but also to, it's much quieter yep. and has a better draw, bigger ducting. And we just found that, yes, whatever you do cook with, that's all being dumped out straight away. It's a baffle on the outside, so it closes up when it's not in use. And I've measured all the levels and it doesn't seem to impact the And do you quality. need to open some window while the exhaust is running? No, I haven't found, I specifically when I tested, didn't open windows and doors. I wanted to get a always worst case scenario. I don't operate as much like some passive houses where they just go, don't ever open. I love opening windows yep. and doors. So yes, we'll get more dust than at certain times, but 
Um, no, you basically the answer is you didn't have to, to do that. Yeah, and sometimes I would cook, I would be using three of the plates in, as opposed to one. You know, I really tested in all scenarios and yeah, air quality wise, it was fine, specifically because of that range hood. Yep. That's on full and that's going all the time. But that's why we wanted it quiet. The other benefit of this type of exhaust hood where the fan is on the outlet is the whole set of ductwork system is under negative pressure where it is sucking air in. So there is minimal chance the flue gas is leaking to the occupied space or the roof space. So it's a very clever system. And if you want to have a high performance house, that's the type of system you want to choose if you don't want to do the reticulating filter system. Rough, yep. I find it hard to believe how quiet you describe this. Let's turn it on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I found it hard the first time. I thought it wasn't working too. So you turn it on. That's on two, three, four, five. That's on the maximum. Wow, you barely hear it. And that's why sometimes we'll be sitting on the couch and going, you know, the internal noise is so exaggerated. What is that noise? I can hear something. You go, oh, yeah, it's the extraction fan. So that... It's quieter it. when, when the fridge kicks in. That's right. The fridge is louder when the fridge kicks yeah. in than, than that. Wow. Absolutely. Well, that reminds me of a lot of people complain about electric car. They find a lot of issue. But I believe it's because the electric car don't have the engine noise to cover all the rattling noise here and there all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Well, if you, if you turn this on full and have a chat in the kitchen, normally with most range hoods, you Even on talk, low, you can't talk. That you can't talk. So yeah. we can talk like this, and this range hood is on full, and you can then get an idea of what the noise, the noise level is like. One other point that some were interested in was the, the fireplace we used to have here. We had a, a, a wood fireplace, and it was, again, big talking and debate. Do we keep it? Do we not? Dale Scott from AFI said, it's going to be too hot. And my wife looked and said, it can never be too hot, but they were absolutely correct because just using the split system in those few times a year, that's more than what you need. And if we put that on with the house as tight as it is, it would have been way too hot. That's exactly the feedback yeah. we got from a fair few of passive house owner. Yeah. They, almost all of them, only turn on the heater once yeah. since they move in and never touch it again. And never touch again. So yeah, not necessary. And being a big air quality point of view, where the flue connects to the box, very difficult to find systems that don't leak at all from there. So measuring particulate matter and that type of thing, I didn't want all of that coming into a fairly tight house. So take that out of the equation also. I got my gas cooked up, yep. but yeah, that, that we definitely lost and, and very happy because we yep. don't need it. I don't think it's mentioned enough, but the amount of pests that are not here where they were before. So because we had condensation because we had moisture and so on we have all the pests that want moisture we had lots of ants find them in all sorts of places everywhere lots of cockroaches it's all gone now we don't have any ants in the house we've got plenty of ants on the outside no problem we live in harmony with them but this is our domain here so they don't come in at all they can't get in we don't have holes in the in the clothing anymore all of those pests are gone spiders we don't have any spiders and the cobwebs and the whatever we don't have to clean those out anymore pest control is massive in a passive house because it's so sealed up yeah. so difficult to get in and then the other thing was was the quiet i mean everyone says yeah with triple glazing whatever it's nice and quiet you don't realize what that actually means when people are having parties and dogs are barking and oh and you can't get to sleep because of all that that's all gone as well. So the amount of stress that is relieved by all of these things being better, I, you know, if they could put a number on that, I think you should. It's not only about the energy and the comfort, it's you feel so much less stress with all these problems being fixed. It sounds like you are extremely happy about this house. Yep. But I still need to ask this. In hindsight, what would you do differently? Well, there's not actually a lot that I would do differently. One, one aspect was when we were looking at all the ground levels outside, 
because we found that a lot of the ground had gone too high and above the, the waterproof and the floor level and the membrane. And we found that there was moisture in a couple of areas because of that. So dug everything back. I personally said, I'll take that on Ooh. and dug it all back. A hell of a job. But then when I saw the concrete slab exposed, I was quite tempted to put in some sort of insulation to, to insulate the slab because we didn't demolish. But then getting advice, I said, look, you know, the hole underneath of that slab is, is not going to be insulated. So I don't know the degree to which that's going to be beneficial. But in hindsight, I would have done it anyway. Yeah. I would have insulated around the whole edge slab. I had it all exposed. And because I found that there's a one degree difference between the south end of the house and the north end yeah. in winter. So it's, it's noticeable. It's a whole degree. Um, and I measured that quite a bit. Um, so I, I think that might make a small difference perhaps because yep. it's so cold down that end. Uh, the other thing is that we cut down on lighting a lot. Used at night, we only have these indirect lights shining up against the wall. Yep. That's all we have on in the house. We have task lighting above the kitchen bench tops and so on where, and desks where we need yep. it. But generally in the room, we were told to cut down and cut down, or I said I wanted to cut down. I hate artificial mm -hmm. light and I could have cut down even more. I just find that we're all too nervous to have too little light because then yep. it's hard to correct that. And as much as we cut down, I would cut down even more. You wow. know, instead of, you know, lots of people, well, this would be filled and filled with, with down lights. And to a degree, I, I still think it's way too much. Usually for this size living area, you got 20 down lights. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and we have what, we've got 10. Yeah, 10, and I'd say we'd need I think we'd get away with half of that. I remember in the previous video, you were very skeptical about reducing the headroom. Yes. How do you feel about it now? I thought it was going to be a real problem. That was a real arm wrestle because I'm, I'm taller and I was like, I, I don't, I still, you know, if I'm standing flat footed, I still can't reach it, but I can where it's been dropped so yep. that we can have all those ducts under the insulation. And to be honest, I don't notice it at all. I, I thought it was going to really be a, a deal breaker, but I was surprised I don't notice at all. I th we were incredibly lucky that when this house was originally built, we paid for higher ceilings. Ceiling. Yeah, it's actually been okay. And for the efficiency of the HRV system, because we drop it and get insulation all that above, I, it's definitely worth it. We had agaves and, and, and a bunch of other plants that were up against the building. And when I was digging out and exposing the slab and then removing the, the plants, it was unbelievable the root systems and how they get in, onto the slab and in areas into the slab, pulling out the roots and going, wow. wow. So that's, this is how water can get in and the intrusion and so on. No garden beds up against the house. I just think that is, that should be the absolute norm. It shouldn't be legal, in my opinion. That's how passionate I am. So yes, they removed all that and then we put this big deck up here. An enormous amount of effort went into that deck and underneath that deck that you don't see. So a lot was sloping all the ground away from the building into drainage, drainage pipes that are put yeah. down at the bottom of that slope using a, a material, a fabric that basically allows the water to get through the fabric, but not all the soil to block it up. And, and so get all the water down to there and having where the stumps are, literally having that fabric come up and build up so that the water can run down it. Like enormous amount of work that went into those because I see it a lot when it comes to decks. No one has any, puts any sort of effort into yep. what's happening under there. They just go, right, let's just whack a deck on. Yep. And enormous problems happen. Out, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, this, if you lifted that, you'd be pretty amazed at what's going on underneath the amount of work. So money and effort and work that went into that that you don't see. And I think that's why people don't but want to do it. But it guarantees the longevity of your house. Exactly. It's not going to gut damage your foundation. Yeah, exactly right. And that's on also we had brick veneer. So we have um, rendered the outside of the building with a natural lime render. So that has come from the ground level up. It's all natural lime render, four coats of it. It's just the most amazing breathable stuff um, and getting harder over the years and sequestering CO2. But then we have used the cement render lower down 
to because seal of the that. Moisture. Exactly. We, we did find that when I took moisture readings in the slab, we did find that where the ground level was higher and had been for years, and I dug it back out, the moisture levels were higher in the slab in those particular areas. So that incentivized me more to say, right, just get it all away, slope it all away, seal it up. So the water, you know, has got to go uphill. It's got to get through the, the render that is the sealant. Yep. It's a horrible, well, I don't like a cement render, but it's a very good sealant. And then we've got the nice natural render all the way up. Any cracking on the render after three years? We've had one small crack in one area about that big. So when they did the render, he put in more control. He was over the top because I said, if this thing cracks, I'm like, please, that's my biggest thing. I don't want to try to start repairing cracks and things. So luckily, no cracks. And it looks like the day it was done, which I was, I was expecting it to deteriorate over the years. And, but it still looks pristine. And I think that's... There's a, a sealant that goes over it, and a natural one. We used graphene stone. There's a natural sealant from Spain that we used that's still very vapor permeable and breathable, but the water will bead on the outside. Not all renders are the same. So when you build or renovate your house, make sure you check with the builder what type of render they are using. Some of the more modern spray-on render, they are not actually renders and can crack quite easily. Okay, now we got Dale with us. For our subscribers, you, you should know Dale very well. We had a discussion with the homeowner, Raf, but there is a few technical questions that I want to ask Dale, the builder, about the render, what happened below this deck, and the condition of the frame. Surprisingly, like the frame wasn't too bad for a 20 year old volume builder house. However, there was some idiosyncrasies within it. Some of the frame wasn't bolted to the slab. Um, there was some of the window connection details were, were pretty dubious. So there were certain things that were probably done in an Australian way, I suppose, but were probably not, not necessarily great building practice. So it was really good to be able to strip the building back, take it right back to its frame and rectify those issues in the process of obviously improving the overall thermal performance of, of the building, which was the, the main objective. It's an obviously biological performance of the building, um, RAF being a building biologist. That was always, you know, really in the forefront of our mind, just making sure that we employed the best building practice that we could and brought the building up to spec from a structural perspective but also from a biological perspective, which by all accounts seems to have, we've hit the mark because Raf and his family seem super happy in the building. Yep. So, Above and beyond. Is, yeah, exactly, which is always great to hear. And I think what leads to that is just being really diligent. And, and again, for me, it's what how I was introduced to Passive House and just that higher level of attention to detail across the board, not necessarily just with energy efficiency and thermal comfort, but with structural integrity as well and, and, and just good building practice in general. An example of that outside of the thermal envelope is, is the deck we're standing on, addressing moisture and addressing the building apron and making sure that moisture is directed away from the foundations. How did you do that? We laid a vapor barrier essentially, uh, or moisture barrier over the top of the ground all around this area in the deck and graded it all to pits to make sure that you know there isn't moisture sitting underneath the decking area, an area that you can't get to later. The water's been graded away and then obviously taken away and, and fed into the legal point of discharge. That's, that's a really important factor on all buildings, new buildings in particular. And it was probably something that was done quite well historically, but has maybe been forgotten a little bit in, in more recent times. Well, I think in the recent time, all I can see is just a layer of black plastic. And yeah. they thought that's good enough. It's an area of knowledge that is perhaps not where it should be in the industry. And it would be nice if people kind of spent a bit more time thinking about that, particularly in the design phase of a building, because that kind of that's the sort of stuff that needs to be designed in early, um, in the same way that an air tightness, uh, a vapor barrier needs to be designed from the onset of the design, essentially. It's not something that you can retrospectively, I mean, mm. you can retrospectively do it as we that's have done here, hard. but it's really difficult to do. So the earlier that you can build these things into the design and think about these design parameters to improve the longevity of the building, the, the better off you are really. Compared to building a brand new passive house, would you say remodeling is the answer? <laughs> CLT is still the answer, it always has been. But I think as far as sustainability and energy efficiency goes, 
retrofitting is always the answer because there's nothing good about knocking something down, throwing all those materials away, or you know, as, as much as you might try to recycle materials, things still get thrown out. And the idea of just knocking something over and reusing, rebuying all of those materials again, reprocessing all of those materials again, that's as bad as you can be for the environment really. So if you have the ability to do so, and you have a building that you're happy with and that you know, maybe the footprint and the, the general layout's working, then so certainly retrofitting is the best thing you can do. For sure. Thank you, Dale, for giving us such an honest review on how he compared building brand new and remodeling to have a high performance building. I Thanks would say Dale. it's often a little bit more fun to build new and you kind of get suckered into that a little bit, but I think having the discipline to, to keep an existing building and, and be more creative with it and do what you can to yeah, just capitalize on those existing resources, why not? You know, it's a great thing for the environment.